Well, thank you all for joining, and uh, thanks to my colleagues at CARE and Water for People for their great presentations. Um, I'm going to try and stick to around 10 to 12 minutes here to keep us on time, and as Brian said, we can take questions afterwards. Um, just to give everyone a little bit of background, so the Water Trust works in western Uganda, focusing on rural schools and villages. Uh, we've been around since 2008, and in that time have brought water and sanitation to more than 200,000 people. Um, in 2016, we started thinking about savings groups in the context of uh, the water points that we had built in this area and our desire to help um, help communities maintain these water points independently. Um, at that time, we actually launched three different pilot programs, one of which incorporated savings groups. Um, the savings group model, as I'll discuss, turned out to be the most successful, and so that's what we're talking about here today, but we also looked at other options. Um, including strengthening the traditional volunteer committees, as well as a simple private utility model. Um, at the same time, as I'll talk about in this presentation, we also started to see improvements beyond just sustainability, especially as they're related to our sanitation improvement efforts. Um, and in the following slides, just to walk you through it, I'll give you a brief summary of the situation where we work in Western Uganda, our work with savings groups to date, the impact we've seen, the value we see in savings groups, the challenges, and then finally, our, our takeaways and plans for the future. Okay, great. Um, so there was a, a great uh, study that came out from, I believe, UpGrow um, last year on the sustainability of water points in rural Uganda. 45% um, of rural water points were broken on a spot inspection. Just 18% met uh, basic standards of yield, reliability, and quality. I think those are numbers we're mostly familiar with. And these other figures are from our own household surveys of the communities we serve. So hand washing facility coverage, for example, is much lower than the sort of national level. Um, and I think this last part is really important for what we're talking about here today, which is the low rate of cash savings. Um, and I think often when I talk about savings groups, with, um, with people that haven't necessarily worked with them directly, um, they'll say that the communities they serve are too poor to save. Um, and I think Stephanie talked a lot about sort of why that's not true on a week-by-week on a -week basis. The amounts are very small. And I think the bottom line is that we really tend to underestimate the amount of money that's in communities just in very small increments. So the communities that we serve um, that I'll talk about that come together to form savings groups that generate more than $1,500 a year in annual savings and interest, um, those same communities, just 67%, or excuse me, 67% have no cash savings of any form. So what was, oh, so what was our journey with savings groups? So as I mentioned in 2016, uh, we started it. So just in terms of the mechanics of what that looks like if you're a nonprofit, um, we brought in a trainer um, that was, you know, sort of master trainer in Village Savings and Loan Association methodology. Um, there's a website, vsla.net, and there's sort of um, uh, a community of practice around VSLA as well as other savings group methodologies like Silk. Um, and so we brought in a trainer, trained our staff, and we began piloting. First, we introduced the models to 20 communities. Um, 18 sort of accepted it. Um, two didn't, and I'll talk a little bit about why later. And then we expanded it uh, later in the year to um, additional communities to get us to a total of 26. Uh, last December, we did a year one evaluation of those initial communities. The evaluation, Brian referenced, is available for download. Uh, here, I'll, I'll talk to a few different results from it, but I'm not going to get into all the details. There's a lot of data there if you're interested. Um, and as of today, we have 125 active savings groups. Um, so, you know, I think that can tell you we sort of scaled up quite a lot. And as an organization, uh, we've sort of looked at the evidence we have available and said that given the relatively low marginal cost of these savings groups, the evidence suggests that it's worth the cost to us um, to integrate it into our traditional village program. And we're starting to do that now, and we plan to, to scale that in the future. See if I can. Okay, so what is our approach to savings groups? I'm going to see if I can make this slide fit. And I did not. Apologies. Brian, can you save me here? Great. Well, sorry about that. I'm trying to get the, the, the text to fit here, but just to speak to what's on the slide. 
you know, I think what's important in terms of how we looked at savings groups is that we looked at both adapting the methodology, the Village Savings Loan Association methodology, and we also looked at sequencing. And I think for us, both were very important. So first to talk about sequencing, you know, before we look to form a savings group, savings group, and we are forming them ourselves typically in these communities, uh, we do sort of village level triggering exercises. So that will include community led total sanitation, which everyone's familiar with, um, but it will also include uh, the, a base, an abbreviated version of a participatory vulnerability and capacity assessment. And so this is an, an exercise that we've adapted from the disaster risk reduction community, where communities are led to map out the risks uh, in their community that they share, how they affect different subpopulations, such as women and children, people with disabilities, and then to develop community action plans to mitigate those risks. So that sort of initial triggering exercise, uh, which we think is important to sort of set the tone for the savings group that we then form with those community members thereafter. In terms of the objectives of the group, um, when we first started, there was really only two, uh, water sustainability and personal savings and credit. Um, now, as we've learned more and seen how these communities are adapting the groups uh, to their purposes, um, it's also starting to incorporate uh, group health and well-being. And similar to what Stephanie alluded to, that includes sanitation improvements and, and discussions around, again, shared health risks related to hygiene and sanitation, but could also be other, other shared issues. Now, in terms of the adaptation, so beyond just sequencing and setting some new objectives, we made some changes to the kind of template uh, for the group constitution that Stephanie mentioned. Um, so in that template, it includes the objectives of water point sustainability. It also includes that the group's gonna maintain a reserve fund of at least $85. Um, and that means that at the end of their annual cycle, when they share out the savings and interest, $85 stays in the group so that when they start saving for the next year, there's still that kind of core fund in case something happens. Um, the constitution also stipulates out contributions, both from group members as well as non-group members. Um, and again, that's sort of typically two to three dollars. Um, yes, and then finally, in terms of sequencing, after we do this initial group training, we do additional uh, coaching and support visits. So this is what would typically happen with a savings group. We do as well, but we also incorporate hygiene and sanitation promotion messaging into these visits. Okay, so in terms of results, so let's get straight to that. Um, so similar to Water for People, we're seeing uh, dramatic improvements in functionality, but you know, with the caveat, and I'll talk about this in a bit, that it's still early days. Um, you know, the initial group of 18 have now um, been at it for 23 months. Some of our more recent pilots from that first year, it's, it's less time. And the only failures we've seen, I think are important uh, to mention, are due to drying out of the water point. In terms of the self-help groups themselves, if the communities accept them, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, if they accept them, we find that they tend to stick around, they tend to renew, uh, demand is quite significant. The one group that has disbanded, uh, it only happened because essentially the land the landowner evicted all the tenants, which happened to be our group members, and they had to leave the area. Um, you know, you know, the, there's the data uh, on the slide around the increase in the amount spent or reserved for water points. This is actually higher than our target. I think what we typically expect to see is around that $85 in reserve funds kept in the group, and then around $35, $40 spent on maintenance and repairs on average, but that can obviously differ by the year. And in terms of the groups, when we look at the strengths of them, we look at a few different factors. Um, some of them are here in terms of membership growth rate. So we saw a significant growth rate and even more significant growth rates than this in the second cycle. Um, and frankly, it's one of the challenges we have is figuring out what to do when groups might increase in size to 40 or 50 people. And that's sort of beyond what uh, the, the ideal size should be. Um, in terms of the amount of money they mobilized, as I mentioned, uh, they mobilized you know, more than $1,500 in annual savings and interest. And I think what's also worth mentioning um, as it relates to kind of the evidence base for savings for WASH is, you know, these savings groups, not just our own, but those formed decades ago, have a really strong track record of mobilizing more than $100 a year for the social fund that Stephanie mentioned. And that social fund can be directed to different purposes, whether it's funeral allowances or things like that, or potentially water. So when we think about what's the evidence that savings groups can mobilize money, uh, for social shared purposes, I, I think it's pretty strong. Um, and, but just to note here, you know, 
in terms of what impacts we haven't seen yet. Um, so we haven't yet seen whether this increased maintenance and uh, expenditure translates into long-term functionality several years from now. Um, and I think, you know, that's going to be one of the, the key items that we want to monitor going forward. Now, impact beyond sustainability. And again, this, I'm, I'm picking up on a lot of themes from Stephanie here. Um, you know, I think that there's a few different components here that are important. And we don't, number one is sort of that I think it meets the household's needs. So we might be interested in households saving for their shared water point. However, if the household has no fun, has no cash savings itself to pay for its own medical emergencies, that's a very tough ask. So we think that one of the reasons why savings groups make it easier for people to allocate money for the water point is that it helps address their own financial risks. Um, another key theme that we hear, you know, are savings culture. Um, again, these are communities that struggle to find a way to save, and the savings groups seem to solve that for them by making it easy to save very small increments. And I, I won't repeat um, what Stephanie already talked to around community empowerment and solidarity, except to say that it's very much the same for us. And to see that, you know, in our work promoting sanitation, it's been really catalytic because when in our communities, there might be 40 households and it's possible that 30 or more might be in the self-help group or excuse me, savings group, what we call self-help groups meeting each week. So we have the majority of the community meeting each week um for a year so that's you know approximately 52 meetings sometimes a few less um and that's been really transformative for us in the interest of time i won't get into gender dynamics but because the groups are majority women um there's a lot of opportunity to change norms around uh decision making around how resources are used around wash okay so what's the secret with savings groups in the interest of time i'm going to go quickly through this but just to say that I think trust is, is the key word for us. It's a word we hear from our staff. It's a word we hear from communities about what changes from the traditional water user committee model where a caretaker is asking for a dollar or 500 shillings here and there. Um, and in addition to that, there is the fact that these institutions are strong. So I guess those will be the two themes I'll pick out from this slide. Um, you know, there's a, again, a strong track record of these groups lasting five plus years, um, sometimes decades. Um, and, and not just lasting, but meeting regularly with high attendance rates on a weekly basis. And as we've already discussed, there's the access to capital. There's a lot of money in these communities, and the savings groups have this magical power to trans translate those very small increments into much larger amounts that are helpful for purposes including water, but can also be used for sanitation and other needs. Okay, so in terms of challenges, if you're an implementer, this is a new methodology. It does require training staff. Um, and it does require oversight, especially in the pilot period. Now, the financial inclusion sector has decades of experience. They have master trainers. They're able to actually train community members to be lead trainers and really lower their cost of creating these groups. Um, that's something we're in the process of doing, but that takes time. So I think if you're looking at implementing this approach, um, you need to allow for that and sort of ramp up uh, slowly for the first year or two and then, and then look to scale if you're seeing the results you want. Um, the second challenge, as I mentioned, we had two communities that sort of refused the groups to begin. And um, in addition to that, we've had a total of five. So around five out of 125 groups that we've introduced the model to have said no. We work in a very diverse area with a lot of internally displaced people um, as well as refugees. Um, so frankly, the fact that it's only five to me is, is a positive. Um, you know, one question that I've heard before is, you know, what about adapting existing savings groups for water point maintenance? Uh, one of the challenges we've had here is that some groups are set up with people across multiple catchment areas, and it becomes very difficult to sort of build um, a consensus that they should be supporting one water point maintenance. You know, we form the savings groups are in a given catchment area, so we have more control there. So I think the evidence um, is yet to be settled on, on sort of whether or not it's possible to adapt savings groups and in what context uh, to take on this broader mandate. Um, and I'll just touch on, because I, I would assume that if, if you're not familiar with savings groups, you would, you would think of the, the risk of having a visible box with fun, funds in it. That certainly is a risk. Um, that said, and we can talk more about this in Q&A, um, it, it, it's not as big as it, as it seems, and there are opportunities to connect these groups with mobile banking resources, but that does take some hand-holding to establish those linkages. Okay, 
So I'm going to wrap up here in the next two minutes. Um, so in terms of our key takeaways, from our perspective, we do have evidence that savings groups can mobilize a lot of more funds than we thought were possible at the community level. And that can be for water point sustainability. Um, that can also theoretically be for sanitation promotion. Um, but that's, that's something that we're looking at we haven't yet seen in action. Um, you know, I've already talked about the, the value of the groups as platforms. And, and as I said, I think from our perspective, you know, the careful adaptation and sequencing is key to kind of really capitalize on the full value of these groups. Because if, if you want the groups to take on a broader social mandate, we think those triggering exercises initially can be, can be really important. And um, in terms of looking forward, in terms of what we need to study, um, again, we, we see a lot of potential to sports sanitation, but we haven't seen it in action ourselves. There's impact in the long term. Are we going to see this um, separation of our groups from their neighboring communities in terms of water pump functionality? Um, that's something we hope to see, but you know that will take time. And then the applicability in different contexts. Our hope is to work with other organizations to pilot these approaches and, and see where it works and where it doesn't work and how it needs to change. So looking forward, um, you know we're constantly refining our implementation model. So we're experimenting, for example with creating a water bag that would go in the box, which would separate the water funds from the other funds. Um, we are also we're looking at how we can train group members to form savings groups in neighboring communities. Um, so those are some of the types of changes we're looking at with our model, and, and we expect to learn more as we implement. Um, we're gonna continue to publish research. We published our year one results last year. Uh, we're doing a follow-up survey in December, and we'll continue to try and share what we're learning about, what impact we're seeing and what we're not. And then, as I mentioned, we're, we're planning to technically support peer organizations to, to adapt this approach um, as needed to different contexts and, and to see how it works uh, outside of Western Uganda where we're working. And um, we are talking with our partners in Kiri and Dungo and Masindi uh, District who are really encouraged by the results. And I would just say here that from their perspective, they're looking for a, a way to, to really empower communities because they don't have the resources to fund the operations and maintenance of all these villages, plus schools and health facilities and things like that. Um, so they're, they're quite keen. Um, and then finally, you know, our hope here today is to really help build a community of practice. We know we're not the only ones working with savings groups in WASH. Um, there's a lot of learning to be done, and our hope is to kind of take the, you know, these, these sort of separate pilots that are going on in different places and, and bring them together so we can learn and push the, the, the sector forward. So uh, with that, I think that's all I have, and uh, I'll turn it back over to Brian. Great. Thanks so much, Chris. Really, really helpful. Really interesting, I think, the resonance between kind of what you and Stephanie presented and how you're finding some of the, the same kinds of things. And the how-to guidance you provided in terms of what does it take to get something like this spun up is, is really, really insightful. I mean, the, the notion of a community of practice, I think, is, is something that's, you know, so needed when all of us are kind of working around some of the same things. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the presenters are able to stay on for a bit longer. We'll run through a few of the questions right now. Um, and I'll start with a question um, about the interest rates that came in earlier. So uh, Stephanie, I think you had mentioned a, a lower interest rate loan around 10% a month. Um, others have mentioned other interest rates. Would be curious to hear folks' perspectives on kind of, and very quick, um, but kind of what the interest rates you're seeing are and how those compare to other interest rates. 10% a month might be low in some contexts, high in other contexts. So just interested to understand that. Let me go ahead and pull everyone off mute really quickly. Um, and we'll just sort of make this a, a free for all and hope that it works out. Um, I think everyone, all the presenters should be unmuted. Um, yeah, so maybe Stephanie, if you wanna go first um, and kind of talk about CARES experience um, and then we can see if others have a response and quick answers please so we can get through as many as we can. Sure. Um, thanks for the question, Matthias. And I actually wrote an answer. So um, the the interest rate is actually defined by the VSLA group members as part of their constitution. So mm -hmm. in Niger, uh, for example, that and that interest rate varies widely from community to community and country to country, though is often uh, supported 
by the facilitator. It kind of helps the community talk through what is a reasonable interest rate. It varies widely, so uh, from 10% a month. Um, I've seen 3% a month in some communities. We've actually seen that when uh, facilitation stops and groups continue on their own, they tend to raise the interest rate over time which is really interesting, up to even 35%, uh, both per month or over a loan repayment period, which is usually no more than three months. Great, thanks. Any other perspectives from anyone else on the line about uh, your experience on interest rates and what that looks like in context? Yes, yes. hi, this is Lika Diogardi from the Water Trust. And um, we also, when we looked at uh, 10%, which is what we started, we discussed with communities whether it was too high or not, and we found that most communities wanted to use 10% uh, on an annual basis. That's 120%, which seems quite high, seems very high, but we found communities wanted to use 10% because it was easy to calculate, and um, uh, they just felt it was, it, it was, the basic thing was it was easy to calculate, and it was high enough where people wouldn't be abusive of the loan. That's interesting. Thanks. Um, another good question here about are there any legal issues in setting up any of these VSLA type entities? Uh, do governments ever have issues with encouraging unregulated lending? And I would be really interested to hear people's perspective on that piece. Sure. I can give a quick answer for the Water Trust. So we uh, register the groups at the sub-county level, so they're legal entities, and um, that's sort of what we're required to do. And um, the government is encouraging of savings groups and typically does not have a very hands-on approach at the moment with them. Um, and as what talking with, you know, kind of government counterparts, what they've just asked is that we ensure that we're coordinating with them and sharing information with them so they're aware of their existence and can link with them. Um, but uh, we haven't had any pressures beyond that. Any others? Similarly from care side, usually they are uh, legal entities registered at the local level. And, and we don't we don't actually by and large encounter many legal challenges at all. Uh, as Chris said, they tend to be uh, broadly supported. Great, that's wonderful to hear. Um, interesting question coming in again from Matthias around um, what's the motivation of people to become a member of this savings group? And do you observe free riding? So I think that free riding could be in different ways. People that aren't contributing in um, accessing finance, but it could also be obviously people that aren't um, contributing, benefiting from the, the water services. Um, so how is that handled both within the wash context and more broadly um, for people that maybe aren't contributing what they're you know, contributing or should be contributing? Sure. Uh, I can Hi, this is just for the, uh, the water trust, what I can just say is, you know, I think the motivation of people to join the savings group is access to savings and credit. Um, so, Again, as, as we kind of mentioned, the, the, the amount of savings that people have and the percentage that are banked in the communities we serve is relatively low, and people greatly value the opportunity to save and most importantly, take out loans. So I think that's the primary value of joining the group. Um, and what we've actually found is that in many cases, people from outside the catchment area will want to join the group. And in many cases, will agree to pay the additional water point contribution just to have access to a group. So just, you know, there's actually a willingness to pay for the water point just to get that credit access. Um, we do still have some issues where, you know, there are neighbors who are not contributing their share and, you know, it, it's not significant enough to affect the the amount of the, the reserve fund that's required for the water point. Um, but I think the way that we look at that is say, even if we can only solve that problem 50%, if we're getting the entire group of 30 plus members to contribute, um, we're, we're addressing the problem enough. Great, was there one other voice on that? Yes, hi, this is Lika Diogardi again from the Water Trust. Um, to add on to that, I think you could say the free riding um, from the perspective of the water point savings, we've actually seen the opposite. We've had members, people trust the VSLA and um, who are in the catchment area but not interested in joining the VSLA and actually paying the water point fees because they trusted the VSLA. So in some ways, uh, I think you could say that free riding has, there's been perhaps less than, than traditionally. 
Great. That's really encouraging. I think one last, uh, two last questions, um, and then we'll wrap up here. One is, I think there's an interesting question when we come to finances um, about this risk of over indebtedness. And this is something we've seen a lot in the microfinance sector um, broadly. Uh, what happens when a, a house struggles to pay back their loans? How are default typically handled? And recognizing that it's important that the money get returned, but also recognizing you know the the risk of over indebtedness here. Maybe something for, for further research. And um, Dylan has kind of a, a quick thought there. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to jump in. I just didn't want to uh, have the water trust take all the questions here. But um, it, just to say that, you know, typically, you know, the households will uh, be extended some sort of forgiveness period. Um, so if they can't pay it right away, they'll have to pay a fine at some point, which is relatively marginal um, and has the loan extended. Um, if they really are not going to pay, the groups will typically try and get some sort of asset like chickens or something like that uh, to take as collateral. And ultimately, if they don't pay, then they are simply typically r removed from the group. And there are provisions for that process in the constitutions. Um, but, but I would say the default rate is really astonishingly low. Um, so it's not something that, that typically happens. Um, and if it does happen for a group, it might be one or two loans in a year of uh, relatively small amounts, like 10 or $20 um, for, again, a loan fund that's around 1500 So it's not, I think because the loans are much smaller, there's not the same challenges that might be in the microcredit sector. Yeah, and maybe just to add to that, Chris, sorry, from CARE's perspective, I mean, agreed. So of our, you know, many years of experience, we have a 99% repayment rate. And so the, the default rate is really, really low. And part of the reason for that is also the really strong sort of group dynamics. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, these are women who meet regularly. There's a lot of um, accountability within the members themselves. And as Chris said, these are relatively small um, loans as well. Thanks, Stephanie. I think the last question is just sort of on the overlap. Um, we've got a few questions around this. The overlap between the water user committee and where there's a formal water user committee and the um, PSLA. And obviously in some cases they're more integrated, in some cases not. Um, but how does that integration work or what are the challenges faced when, when looking at that? Um, you know, Stephanie, you talked about it more as the loans that people could access sort of on their own or, or perhaps in that social fund. Um, but how does that work, especially when maybe not every member of the community is a member of the VSLA or the, the group, um, but is obviously using the, the water point? So kind of a different angle on that same question of free riders. Um, how, you know, where there are two separate groups, what does that look like? Where it's one group, how does it deal with people that might want water services but not want to necessarily be part of the, the savings and loan? Yeah, from you know, from CARE's perspective, we we there's a bunch of different models. So we have you know VSLA and WASH and maybe 20 different countries and uh, programs at this stage. So in some cases, for example, uh, it's 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 that the VSLA group members overlap with the WASH committee. So let's say the president and the secretary. Uh, of the VSLA are also in the, the WASH committee, for example. So that kind of governance from the VSLA transfers over into the WASH committee. And it's as simple as that. Sometimes it's, as you said, Brian, the social funds or, you know, the, the funds themselves are used um, to pay for the water points. And that platform, that weekly platform is something we as CARE use often as a training platform, as a discussion platform. So there's strong interlinkages among, you know, various of those. I'm, I'm sure the Water Trust can answer more specifically since they're doing a much more pur purposeful integration of those two elements. We do see, um, in many cases, the VSLA groups uh, essentially um, serve as platforms for other community governance. So we do this a lot with agriculture where all of the VSLA members are producers of the same you know, crops. And so therefore come together as a VSLA group to also be a producer group, to also manage you know, resources and collective financing around uh, agriculture, but in some cases also water point committees. So the VSLA group might then essentially be the management model for um, for water point committees in some of our cases. But I'll turn over, I know the Water Trust has more specific experience there. 
Sure. Um, yeah, I can just say that, you know, I think, you know, from our perspective, this is something we thought a lot about. We actually just had some management team meetings to talk about this kind of very question, the intersection of the water user committees and the savings groups. Um, and, you know, they are separate entities. And if, if an individual just wants to contribute their user fee um, to the water user committee or the savings group, um, and that's it, then that's fine. Um, in which case, that's their really their only interaction. Um, in our context, the water user committee is the one still in charge of maintaining the water point and collecting the fees from non-user, from non-group members, and um, then providing those fees to the, the, the savings group. And then in addition, um, the water user committee is, is still in charge of contracting for any maintenance and repairs and requesting those funds from the savings group. So that's how those sort of entities interact with that makes sense. Great. Wonderful. And can I go ahead? Hi, this is <laughs> Yeah, go right ahead. This is Lika Yagardi again from the Water Trust as well. Just to add on with what Chris is saying, we designed it separately purposefully to ensure that there was a mechanism for those who were who were expending expensing expending the money spending the money and in charge of finance versus those saving the money and in charge of the funds which is a common uh, problem with uh, the management of WCs the money goes missing because uh, by virtue of the way the model is built uh, people are put in a hard position they're they're Supposed to spend the money, but they're also expected to save it. So the self-help, the VSLAs are transparent. You've got three keys. The money is secure, but there are still those who know how to manage the water point, and um, they still need to. It, it just builds and enhances the uh, oversight mechanisms for the water point, and uh, so that is the purposeful way of why we did uh, split it, as well as being careful to ensure that not all water trust, uh, not all water and sanitation or water user committees are on the self-help group executive committee for continued transparency. Great, wonderful. Well, thank you so much to all of our presenters and for all the panelists. We had an amazing number of people stay on even a bit after the webinar. I think this is something that's really caught people's attention. I mean, Chris, to your point, hopefully we'll, we'll kind of spur a community of practice. Um, uh, a massive, massive thank you to Chris at the Water Trust for organizing this entire webinar and, and kind of circling the wagon to make today happen. Um, we're really, really pleased to be a part of it, and we'll be sharing the recording uh, with all of the participants. So thank you all so much for joining, and we'll be in touch soon. Take care.